Welcome to the Jay Aruga Show, the first conservative podcast in the Philippines where we help you defend life, marriage, the family, and the truth in this crazy world that we're living in. We're back from our mid-season break, and whenever we go back from a break, we start strong. This week's episode is a special episode because it's the first time we'll, we'll release the episode almost simultaneously with Unboxing Catholicism. The audio will be on my podcast while the video will be in Unboxing Catholicism's channel. And since we're doing a series on the book of Revelation in Unboxing, we invited a guest to discuss with us the book of Revelation. But before that, I would like to introduce our co-host, the creator of Unboxing Catholicism. Listeners of this podcast already know him. He's none other than my friend, Burns O. Kasi. Burns, how are you doing? Hello, Jay. It's an honor to be serving with you and our fellow listeners of the Jay Aruga podcast and the Unboxing Catholicism podcast. Thank you so much for this opportunity that you have given me to collaborate with your growing ministry. And I'm so happy to be here and so pumped to be one of your to be your co-host for this very very special interview i'm already fanboying because the one we're about <laughs> to introduce to our audience is someone so special for me someone who has caused an immense conversion god has used him to be part of my story as a former anti-catholic protestant who once asked my mom to burn the statues of the saints and now we're here in our advocacy and boxing Catholicism to defend the faith clearly without being preachy. So thank you so much, Jay, for giving me this opportunity to co-host with you. Okay, Burns, let's not delay. I'm excited as well. I'll give you the honor to introduce our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners of the J. Aruga podcast, before we had in our Unboxing Catholicism and J. Aruga show, the founder of Catholic Answers, Mr. Carl Keating himself. Now we have the senior apologist or one of the senior apologists of Catholic Answers, author of several books like The Drama of Salvation, The Fathers Know, know Best, Master Vision, Daily Defense, among others. And he's the host of a popular podcast called Jimmy's Mysterious World. Please welcome the one and only Mr. Jimmy Aiken. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kumusta, Jay at Burns. Wow. <laughs> Jimmy, That's get a so kick out of that. <laughs> thank you. Th thank you. How yeah. are you doing, Jimmy? I'm doing well, and thank you very much for having me here. It's always a pleasure to interact with folks, including uh, brothers and sisters on the other side of the planet. So it's it's uh, it's great to be here, and uh, thank you for arranging this interview at a time where I'm actually awake. So <laughs> I'm not sure what time it is in your time zone, but this oh, is a perfect one for me. It's 5.13 here. Uh, how's everything, by the way, on your side of this mysterious world, Jamie? Oh, it's going fine. Um, I recently moved back from California to my hometown in Arkansas, which is in kind of the middle of the United States. And, uh, and things are going really well. So uh, I appreciate it. Great. We are so happy to have you here with us, Jimmy. And just want to share with our audience that my first exposure to your work, apart from the uh, Catholic Answers podcast, is reading a bit about your story in Sur Surprised by Truth, a compilation mm -hmm. of conversion stories written and edit or edited by Patrick Madrid, whom I recently edited, met edited, yeah. At the Franciscan University of Steubenville's uh Defending the Faith Conference, along with Dr. Scott Han. Trent Horn, Deacon Harold, and many others. And we are very, very excited to get our audience started with the Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. But first, with a little bit about your story. So could you share okay. a capsule form of your story as a Catholic? You know, were you always a Catholic or how did you become a Catholic apologist? Uh, I'm a convert. Uh, I grew up here in Arkansas. My uh, parents belonged to a, a denomination, although they don't identify as a denomination, but a Christian group called the Church of Christ. And um, when I was in, when I was about seven years old, they stopped going to church. And so after that, I was raised nominally Protestant. Uh, we weren't very religiously active. When I was in my teenage years, I 
was involved in what's called the New Age movement. And then when I was 20 years old, I had a conversion to Christ. And I wanted to uh, devote my life to the ministry in some form. I wanted to become a seminary professor in a Protestant context. But I recognized that which that I need to be careful because which church was within convenient driving distance or which one who had a preacher I liked or which one had music I liked, none of those were good tests of which has true doctrine. And I recognized that doctrinal truth is the most important thing. So I needed to go where the doctrine was true. And to keep from reflexively just falling into the beliefs of a local church, you know, that I happen to go to, I made a point of studying the the beliefs of all different groups of Christians. So I, I read Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, I read everybody. And eventually I made a discovery in, uh, in well, I read the Bible all the way through, or at least I thought I did. I read all of the proto-canonical books. And, and I, in reading the New Testament, I ran across various passages that didn't really fit with a Protestant perspective, like where Jesus says, whoever sends you forgive they are forgiven whoever sends you retain they are retained that sounds catholic that sounds like the sacrament of confession similarly when uh, peter writes and he says baptism now saves you well that didn't sound like the teaching of my local baptist church that sounded catholic and i had always said that peter was not the rock that the rock was the revelation in matthew 16 that the rock was the revelation that jesus is the messiah and i had arguments that i would use to support that but one day i was reading that passage again and i noticed structural features in the text that required that peter be the rock and it's so obvious you didn't even have to go to greek you could read it in english or in tagalog and the structures are still there so i had to change my opinion on that passage and say that uh, Peter is the rock on which Jesus builds his church. And that's going to mean that once Jesus ascends back into heaven, Peter's going to be in charge of the church. So the person who is in charge of the church in Jesus's absence, that's a good description of the Pope. And so I concluded Catholics were right that Peter was the first Pope. Whether there were any future Popes after Peter was an open question, but I had to say, well, Catholics are right about Peter being the first Pope. What I need to do now is review all of the areas of systematic theology with an open mind to see our Catholics right about other things. And when I did that, I took about a year in grad school. Uh, I was studying philosophy in grad school, and I took about a year to review all the different categories of systematic theology. And that's when all of those Bible verses came back off the shelf that sounded Catholic. And I ended up concluding Jesus meant what he said. Peter's the first pope. The sacrament of confession is real. Baptism really does save you and other things. And so I decided I needed to become Catholic because that's where the true teaching, the true doctrine was. And this was happening at the same time that my wife was dying and she got cancer at a phenomenally early age. She was just 27. And um, I was actually received into the Catholic Church in her hospital room using the emergency shortened form of the rites just four days before her death. And that was now... 31, 32 years ago, um, just had the anniversary of that happen. And you can read about all that in my conversion story, which is called A Triumph and a Tragedy. It's in the book, I wrote it, but it's in the book that Patrick Madrid edited called Surprised by Truth. It's also at my personal website, jimmyakin.com. J- Jimmy, it's a, it's a phenomenal story. And Burns and I were both converts or or reverts Mm -hmm. from the the faith. Uh, Burns was Mm -hmm. an anti-Catholic Protestant. I was an atheist. And Mm -hmm. the the turning point usually for myself are books from Catholic Answers and some of them were Mm -hmm. your books. And I enjoyed Mm -hmm. reading your books. My favorite is uh, Drama of Salvation is my favorite. It's Uh among the top. And I... I enjoyed reading it. I, I from that book I realized that there's really 
some the, the infight between the Protestants and the Catholics. Sometimes we talk past each other when it comes to uh, faith justification by faith or by works. But there are a lot of common ground that we can have with our Protestant brothers and sisters. And I, yeah, go go ahead. In, in fact, on the subject of justification, we're a lot closer than mm -hmm. people realize. Catholic. The Catholic Church does not use the formula justified by faith and works. That's not in any of the Church's documents on justification. And actually, mm -hmm. the Protestant faith alone formula, although it's problematic because it can be misleading, it can also be understood in a perfectly Catholic sense, as Pope Benedict XVI yeah. pointed out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, anyway, I'd just like to ask, Burns, what's your favorite Jimmy Aiken book? Oh, a lot. You know, um, I haven't read all the books yet, Jimmy, but I love watching you on the Catholic Answers podcast, watching you and listening to you. I love the way you guys did the apologetics online course. So I bought that and I'm totally enjoying it. And I've been encouraging people to do that because here in the Philippines, Unboxing Catholicism is a ministry that promotes dialogue and apologetics. So our advocacy is to defend the faith clearly without being preachy. And we encourage people to gradually unbox the faith on a daily basis. That's why we also promote the daily defense, which is one of our uh, favorites here in the Philippines. So thank you so much for writing that. And we are really inspired and touched by your conversion story. It really shows that when someone is honestly seeking the truth, the Holy Spirit will really guide you into the fullness of what God wants you wants you to to discover and in your case it's the catholic faith in any case i think in the case of jay and myself as well that's been the case you know when we started being honest about what we do not know when we started being humble and accepting the leading of the holy spirit leaving in not leaving any stones unturned in the search for truth and that's where that's how we find catholicism that's how it makes total sense to us so thanks be to god to your story jimmy and yeah, Jay, I just wanted to, to, to know as well, how did you become a Catholic apologist from all of these? Like, did you have to apply for it? You know, did you have to uh, write books first or articles? Like, what's the process like? And I'm asking this because there are a lot of Filipinos who are also interested in becoming apologists. And it might be good for us to give them a starting point somewhere. Well, the way that I became an apologist is a little bit different than what might apply in other regions. Um, so I had always had, even as an evangelical, I had an interest in apologetics. So I would study Christian apologetics books and I would engage in apologetic discussions with people. Then because I had given myself a background in the viewpoints of all different groups of Christians, when I did my review of the categories of systematic theology, I had a lot of unlearning to do because I knew the arguments for various positions. And in reviewing them with an open mind, I learned various Catholic arguments that I concluded were better, that the evidence actually better supported the uh, Catholic faith. And in the process of doing the research for that, I contacted Catholic Answers to get some questions answered. And so I'd become aware of Catholic Answers. And after my wife passed on, I came out to California and auditioned for, I applied for the job of apologist and I ended up getting it. And I've been here ever since. I've been here at Catholic Answers for more than 30 years now. Um, so that's how I did it. But it's, and as then I had a lot of on the job training and I'm also what's referred to as an autodidact, meaning I teach myself. So I'm always studying. I'm always learning new things. I'm always teaching myself new things. I sometimes will take classes or use tutors, but I'm always learning something. And so then after I began doing apologetics, I continued to learn and not just about what you might think. Um, I ended up having to learn a lot about liturgy, which is not really apologetics, but there are lots of questions people have about liturgy. I ended up learning a lot about canon law because I had to help people with their marriage situations 
You know, like maybe they've had a divorce and remarried, and how do you sort that out if they want to come back to the church? So I had to learn all of these other areas as well. Um, so it's really a lifelong learning process. Now, in my case, I Catholic Answers existed. It was a ministry where I could be employed full time as an apologist. And maybe there's a ministry like that in your area, or maybe there's not. But even if there's not, you can always study, you can always read more, you can engage in apologetics in discussions, either in person or online or things like that. So there are ways that anybody can um, can get into apologetics. It may or may not involve working for a ministry like I do, but everybody can participate in it to the degree that they're able. One thing, now you mentioned this, uh, Burns, is um, a, a, a set of video courses that Catholic Answers has been producing. It's called the Catholic Answers School of Apologetics, and we have different online courses. They're sh made up short videos, so you can watch them at your own pace. And um, if you go to schoolofapologetics.com, you can find out what we ha have available. We're always producing new courses, and we are, you know, setting up an online school for training apologists around the world. And you could take courses from professional apologists and learn how they do it. Wonderful. I am a huge fan of the School of Apologetics. And in Unboxing Catholicism, Jay and I and our team are also trying to put up something like a school of apologetics in Filipino to also help mm -hmm. our Catholic friends over here. Cool. Okay. We had a long introduction, Burns, Jimmy. With that, let's go to the book of Revelation. And just to give you, Jimmy, a backstory, we started this series in Burns' YouTube channel and podcast, Unboxing Catholicism on the book of Revelation. I'd like to ask right off the bat is john the revelator apostle john because it seems like many people just accepted this fact without challenging it well whoever wrote revelation his name was john and we know that because he names himself in the book he says i your brother john saw this revelation on the lord's day meaning sunday and so he's definitely someone named John, and we can deduce a few things about him from reading the book itself. One of them is he was not a native Greek speaker. His Greek style is very unusual. It, it, he also is extremely familiar with the books of the Jewish Old Testament. So it looks like he was a non-native Greek speaker um, who came from a Jewish background. And that, and he was a follower of Jesus. We can say all of that with a high degree of, and he lived in the first century. We can say all of that with a high degree of certainty. When it comes to, is he the same John that is John the Apostle, John the son of Zebedee? There's actually a debate on that among the church fathers. And some of the church fathers will say, yes, he's John, son of Zebedee, John the Apostle. But other church fathers say, no, he's a different John. They will say there were two prominent Johns in the early church. Actually, John was an extremely common name. There were actually multiple prominent Johns, like John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. His Jewish name was also John. Mark was his Latin name. Um, but uh, they, according to various church fathers, there were two prominent Johns who lived at Ephesus. One of them was John the Apostle, and the other was a man named John the Elder. And some early church fathers say Revelation was written by John the Elder, who was also an eyewitness of Jesus's ministry and who was, had Jewish background and who was from Jerusalem. And so he's this other eyewitness of Jesus's ministry that's prominent in the first century, and some early church fathers say he's the one that wrote Revelation and maybe more of the books attributed to John in the New Testament. But because he wasn't an apostle, he wasn't the most famous John. And so the books in the New Testament that are attributed to John ended up being accidentally attributed to the famous John, John the Apostle, rather than this other John. Yeah, uh, because... What would be the implication, Jimmy, for us readers if this is a different John, not John the Apostle? Well, 
it would it would it would it, it doesn't really it's this is not a matter of faith um what's a matter of faith is that revelation like the other books of the bible are divinely inspired and they convey god's truth who wrote them or when they were written is something that is not a matter of church teaching so the church allows people to scholars in particular to discuss those issues and try to figure out you know when and where were they written and by whom and it allows a diversity of opinions on those but as long as you say this is divinely inspired this comes from god that's the most important thing and that's what the faith teaches so it really doesn't make a big difference if you think it's written by john the apostle or by john the elder you know that may color how we read a few passages but it still conveys the same fundamental truth from god Mm. and with that who is the intended audience of the book of revelation and what is the message brought to mm -hmm. this audience by by john the the primary audience are members of seven christian communities that live in asia and this is not the asia where y'all live uh -huh. this is it's not china not and japan and <laughs> philippines and yeah this asia is the roman province known as asia minor uh -huh. or the little the little asia and that is a basically modern turkey so there were a number of christian communities in turkey we actually know there were more than seven we know for mm -hmm. example that that like colossi had a christian community because Paul wrote the the letter to the Colossians. Well, that's in this area, but it's not mentioned in Revelation. So because the number seven is a number for completeness in the Bible, it looks like John was directed to write to these seven churches that were all along this one road. Now, at the time, John is, is in exile on an island called Patmos, which is right next to Turkey and it, it wasn't a prison colony but they did exile people there just to get them out of the way mm -hmm. and so john mm -hmm. sees this vision and he writes it down and he's told to send it to the seven churches of asia which are these certain seven churches that all fall along one road so the messenger you know presumably had seven copies of the book and he would go down the road to these seven churches it's kind of in a crescent shaped road yeah. Uh, yeah. he would go from one church to another and deliver them a copy and so that's the primary audience a group of christians living in modern turkey in the first century and the basic message is cheer up saints things are going to get worse mm -hmm. um you've already experienced some difficulty and persecution for your faith you're going to experience more but god will win in the end and so that's the basic message of the book of revelation it foretells a time that the audience would experience of great testing and stress but ultimately god would win and if you're faithful to god god will make sure that that you make it to heaven and everything will be okay for you in the end and for modern audiences jimmy the, the common question is if these these messages were written for seven churches how does it what how does it concern me uh how does it concern the modern audience well there are different theories about that now there are different ways of understanding the book of revelation one of them is it would say the bulk of the book of revelation not all of it because everyone agrees the first part of the book of revelation clearly applies to the first century you know john's writing to his audience to the seven churches of asia and then at the end of the book of revelation that clearly applies to events that are still in our future like the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment and things like that the question is what about all this stuff in the middle you know how do, how does that apply to history where are we in that sequence one theory that's very common in evangelical protestantism not all protestantism but in evangelical protestantism one theory is known as futurism and it says the bulk yeah the beginning of revelation does apply to the first century and then there's a big jump to the end of history to things that are still in our future and most of the book applies to events in our future and so that's why this view is called futurism another view would say no it's not like that 
most of the book of Revelation applies to events early in church history. And, and this view is called preterism. It says that these most of the book of Revelation occurs before us. It's pre-us, so it's called preterism. Then there's a view called historicism that says Revelation is essentially a map of church history. So you start at the beginning and you slowly work your way through the events of history so you could find a part of the revelation that this is the 200s and the 300s and the the 1200s and and the 1500s and so forth. And then the kind of the last view is known as idealism and it says Revelation really isn't trying to tell us about a specific historical period or set of historical periods. Instead, it tells us about the kind of events that kind of happen over and over again in church history. So it kind of equally applies to all ages. So those are the theories, the basic four. The question would be, which is which is best supported by the evidence? Well, one of the views that almost nobody holds anymore is the historicism view. This is the map view that says Revelation is essentially a map of church history. And the reason nobody holds that anymore, is, at least in the scholarly community, is because every proposed map has failed. Um, you know, you, people have tried to match up the events in Revelation to different major events in church history, like the rise of Islam or the rise of Protestantism or things like that. And everyone, you wait a little while and the map fails. And this has happened over and over and over again. The historicist mappings just don't work. And so this view gets basically no scholarly attention today, which leaves us with futurism, idealism, and preterism. Well, one of the problems for futurism is it says right at the beginning of the book and right at the end of the book, the, this, John is revealed, uh, this is revealed to John to show God's servants what must happen soon. Soon is not 2,000 years later. And so that's not a natural reading of the word soon. Now, you could make it fit, but it's not a natural reading. So that's one problem with futurism. Another problem with futurism is how do you get from the first century at the beginning of the book to our future? There's got to be some big jump. You know, if we're, if we're not giving a map of church history, then you've got to jump over most of church history. So where is that jump? It's got to be, if most of the book applies to our future, the jump has to be early in the book. But there are no passages early in the book that suggest a jump or a long period of time. So these are problems for futurism. What about idealism? Well, um, you, you could say that the book describes things that happen in every era of church history, but it also clearly has a structure in time. The beginning of the book is clearly about the beginning of church history, and the end of the book is clearly about the end of church history, and the whole thing is said to happen soon. It doesn't. It sounds like we're getting a prediction of a specific sequence of events, not a sequence that's going to repeat over and over again. It's not like John said, God gave me this vision to show his servants what's going to happen over and over again. You know, so that's a problem for idealism. And that gets us back to preterism. Well, preterism fits very nicely with the statement at the beginning and the end of Revelation that this is going to happen soon. So that's in its favor. It takes Revelation as a, as a chronicle of events, which also fits. You know, it's not like this is all going to happen repeatedly. And if you ask the question, well, how do we get from the past to the future? If most of the book applies to the beginning of church history, but the end of the book applies to the future, then somewhere late in the book, there should be a passage where we jump over a big period of history without dwelling on it. And there is that. That's at the beginning. Revelation has 22 chapters, and at, in chapter 20, we have a period known as the millennium, where the devil is bound so that he can't deceive the nations, 
and this period goes on for a thousand years, which is a symbol, the number a thousand is a symbol of a very large amount or long period in scripture. It's like when when God says um, uh, that uh, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. It doesn't mean there's a thousand and first hill where he doesn't own the cattle. You know, it means all of the hills. Uh, similarly, when it says, you know, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years, that doesn't mean that it's not a thousand and one years. It just, this is a symbol, this is a stock number for a long period of time. And so, Actually, what we what preterism would lead us to expect is exactly what we see in Revelation. Most of the book is describing events that are going to happen soon from the perspective of John's audience. So the, it's what the original audience would expect. But then there's going to be a long period where the devil can't deceive the nations. And that's what happened after the after the early persecutions of the church, which is what this material would describe then the gospel triumphed and it spread all over the world and the devil couldn't deceive the nations. And then after that, there will be an unleashing of the forces of evil and we get to the events like the resurrection and the last judgment, and that's still in our future. So I think from a reason perspective, if you if you look at the course of church history and you just look at the structure of the book of Revelation and how the original audience in first century Turkey would have understood it, they would understand it in a preterist light. Most of this is telling us about a persecution that happens early in church history. Then there's going to be a long period where the devil is bound and the gospel is going to advance. And then there's going to be the events like the resurrection and the uh, the final judgment. Wow. I mean, it's so rich how we can look at the book of Revelation in so many angles, Jimmy. And each of those approaches totally makes sense. But our viewers might ask, and especially when I was a Protestant, Jimmy, I can't seem to wrap my head around this Catholic notion of end both. Like for me as a mm -hmm. Protestant before, I had to believe in one thing. Like how do I exactly view the book of Revelation? Now, does the church particularly endorse a specific way of looking at this? And then having mentioned all of these different considerations, is it even important for a Catholic to seriously consider the dating of the book of Revelation? And will it change the way we decipher or interpret this very you know, cryptic book as one might describe it? Mm -hmm. So the church does not have a teaching on which of the four views I just described is correct. It leaves that matter to scholars. And I've tried to sketch in a very basic way the kinds of arguments that have led me and others to conclude that most of the book should be understood as applying to early in church history. How early, similarly, the dating of the book is something that scholars can debate. Um, a common view is that Revelation was written in the AD 90s, um, you know, about 60 years after the time of Jesus. However, there's another view that says it was written before the year 70, so maybe 40 years about after the time of Jesus. Does, does that difference between 60 and 40 make a huge difference in how you interpret the book? Well, not really. It could. Yeah, um, one of the things that was actually Jesus's most famous prophecy, other than his own resurrection, was that the Jewish temple was going to be destroyed. And that happened in AD 70. And so if Revelation is written before AD 70, it might include material that pertains to the Jewish war that led up to the destruction of the temple. If it's written in the AD 90s, though, that's in the past. And so it it would not presumably include material about the Jewish war. So that is a question where the dating of the book uh, makes a difference. You know, does this book contain information about the Jewish war and the destruction of the temple, or does it come after that? So it does make a little bit of difference, but the fundamental message of the book that Christians are going to go through a time of persecution, but God will ultimately win, that remains the same. And you mentioned there are two uh, two possible ways. Scholars think that they're at the latter end of the first century or the 1980. Mm -hmm. 
and the other one is in the beginning uh, not not the beginning the, the, in the before 60s. before before the destruction of the temple yeah. which is the fulfillment of Matthew 24 uh mm-hmm. chapter 24 the Olivet discourse uh what would what's the reasonable view for well, I th- there are scholars who support both views. My own view is that I think it was written before AD 70. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. I'll, I'll just be brief about them. But one reason is the book describes the temple in Jerusalem as still in operation. There's a point in the book where, where John is told to go to the temple in Jerusalem and measure it. And, and he's told, but, and we know this is the temple on earth. It's not God's heavenly temple. It's clearly the temple on earth because he's told, but don't measure the outer court of the temple because that's given over to the Gentiles for the Gentile until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, they get to trample the outer court. Okay, so Gentiles don't get to go to heaven and trample God's outer court of his heavenly temple. So this is this is clearly the earthly temple, but it's still functioning when it's still in operation, and John's told to go measure it. So it, since it was destroyed in August of AD 70, this would need to be written before August of AD 70. So that's one reason that gives us a general time frame. But I think we can be more specific because John sees the beast that rises from the sea has has seven heads, and he's told, and we're told several things about this beast. We're told that its heads represent seven kings and seven hills or mountains. Well, Rome was famous in the ancient world for having seven hills, you know, the Capitoline Hill and the Viminal Hill and so forth. Um, so it was famous for that. So that makes us think this could be Rome. Did Rome have a line of kings? Because these kings come one after another. John is told five have fallen, one is, and another is going to come after, but only reign for a short time. Did Rome have a line of, of seven kings in the first century? Well, we have no king but Caesar, as 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 the crowd said um so yeah they had a line of kings we're also told that um that this beast um persecutes the saints and including the apostles did rome persecute the saint christian saints including the apostles in the first century yes it did the beast demands to be worshiped as an emperor did the roman emperors do that or to be worshiped as a god did the roman emperors do that yes they did they there was this cult of emperor worship in the first century and some of them like caligula and nero were really insistent about you need to worship me as a god Um, so we see this converging series of points of evidence that point to the beast representing the, there are others too. One that I'll mention, which I think we'll get to, or I'll at least mention it is if you add up Nero Caesar in Hebrew or Aramaic, because each letter is a number in Hebrew and Aramaic, you add up Nero Caesar, it comes out to 666, which is the mark of the beast. Yeah, so we've got all this evidence pointing to the beast representing the first century line of Roman emperors. And if that's the case, then we can figure out when the book of Revelation was written. Because five have fallen, and one is. And one is going to come, but reign only a short amount of time. So who are the five emperors that have fallen? Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Who's the one? The one would be Nero's successor, Galba. And the one who is to come that reigns only a short time is Galba's successor, Otho. Otho did reign only a short time, three months. So he did reign only a short time. So if Revelation is written in the reign of of Galba, that tells us when it was written. Galba reigned from June 8th, AD 68, which was the day before Nero committed suicide, to like January 15th of 69. So there's about a seven-month window between June of 68 and January of 69 where this book would have been written. So I think we can determine it with remarkable precision. It was written in this seven-month window, basically the second half of AD 68. 
And that is significant, seven months. And you would see a lot of sacramental uh, symbolism in the book of Revelation about seven, you know, all of these very important figures in the Bible. So that makes a lot of sense, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Maybe. I wouldn't argue for its dating based on a on John didn't know how long Galba's reign was going to last, but God do. So maybe on a divine level, there's there's something there, but I don't think John would have known that. And a lot of, are, of people are are linking the events in the book of Revelation to the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, the, the mm-hmm. Jerusalem temple. And there are a lot of parallelisms. Uh, I think Josephus even wrote some of them that coincide with what's written in the book of Revelation. And that could give a stronger indication of the dating that is before the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jimmy, our our minds are just being blown, Burns and I. (laughs) So thanks for, Jimmy. We're really grateful that you're here. Uh, okay, let's. No, no problem. Let, let's you go want to do to the symbols now. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. We're trying to squeeze in as much as we can, and we'll, we'll just uh, try to go through the symbols. Uh, so this is maybe may, maybe not in order. We'll, we'll try to squeeze in what we can. Uh, let's try the four horsemen first of Revelation. Okay. Uh, well. So, yeah, so with the four horsemen, we see a progression. Uh, now, uh-huh. th- these occur in um, in primarily like Revelation chapter 6 and 7. And John has seen a vision of a scroll that is sealed with seven seals, and Jesus, the Lamb, is opening the seals. And as he pulls off the first seal, John sees a horseman on a white horse, and he's given a bow, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Then he, Jesus pops off the second seal, and he sees a red horse, which is identified with war. Then he pops off a third seal, and he sees a black right, a black horse. And riding the black horse is a guy with scales, which was what you used to measure quantities, like if you were buying food. And he hears these prices announced that are fantastically expensive. And so it's like gonna, you're, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg just to buy grain to make food. And it's like if you heard the price of rice was $1,000 a pound, okay, that's a signal you're in a famine situation. And so this third horse seems to signify famine. And then uh, Jesus pops off the fourth seal and he sees, now in English, this often gets translated a pale horse, but what it says in Greek is choros or green so you got a white horse, a black horse, a red horse, and a green horse. And the green horse comes forth, and its its rider is death. So you see this progression of first horse, war, famine, and death. Now, for most of these, the symbolism is really obvious. The question is, what about that first horseman? Because later in Revelation, Jesus is seen riding a white horse. This is like in chapter 19. And so a lot of people want to say, oh, that first horse in in the first rider with a white horse, that must be Jesus. And this is a spiritual conquest. Jesus is going to go out and conquer spiritually. But there, I, and that's a possible theory. I happen to think that's not correct. Um, the reason is lots of conquerors rode white horses. One of the reasons is white horses are impressive to look at, but another, and they're not that common, but another is white horse. I took a class in horsemanship once. White horses have better vision than other horses. So as pack animals, the white horses can see danger approaching the furthest. And so white horses tend to be the leaders of horse packs. And if you're a leader of humans, you might want to be on the white horse that has the better eyesight and that gets more respect from the other horses. So actually white horses are associated with leaders of all kinds, not just Jesus. And which makes more sense, the progression, Jesus is gonna spiritually conquer, and that's gonna lead to a war that's physical, that's gonna result in, that's gonna cause famine and death, or there's a Roman general who's going to go out and conquer, and it's going to lead to a war that's going to result in famine and death. 
Well, it seems to me the latter interpretation makes a lot more sense. It's a much more natural progression. So I would interpret the first horseman not as Jesus, but just as a Roman political leader, like an emperor or a general that's going to cause a war that's going to cause incredible suffering, hardship, and death. I would like to follow up on that, Jimmy. It's a reasonable interpretation on the four horsemen that uh, the first horseman on the white horse is a secular conqueror. Yeah, because they're the ones who start wars. Uh, Yes, yes. There are some Catholic commentators who say that this is Jesus. That's what Mm -hmm. we started with. And how would... Uh, us Catholics reconcile some of these differences in interpretations and opinions. There there are two different opinions, and the Mm. Church hasn't condemned either one of them, so you're free to make up your mind which you think is correct. Mm. I think the evidence better supports the the military political conqueror theory rather than the Jesus theory because it makes better sense out of the sequence that we're looking at. If that horse was any color other than white, nobody would connect it with Jesus. And, and, and the fact that it is white does not prove it's Jesus because lots of emperors rode white horses. They were a symbol of prestige. So instead of, instead of saying Jesus is the only buddy who ever gets to ride a white horse, what the path, what chapter 19 is doing is putting Jesus up there with other emperors who also got to ride white horses and saying he's, he's like them. He's up on that same plane. He's even higher. He's the king of kings. Thank you, Jimmy, for that. And it's so nice to see different perspectives. And as a Protestant before, I had this tendency, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners may have this question, why can't the church just choose one way to look at this particular symbol. So can we give a sort of advice for people who are still in that mode? No, Mm -hmm. there has to be one way of looking at it. Why can't the church, if it's the fullness of truth, why can't it just, you know, tell us definitively the the best way to look at which, what this horseman symbolized? Because this understanding can help us in unpacking and unboxing the way we can view the different levels of interpretations for the next symbols that we're going to discuss. So um, there's there's no special reason why revelation would be privileged in such a process. If you're asking the church to tell us, you know, what this means, it's going to need to tell us what every other passage of the Bible means. And so the church would need to effectively write a commentary on the entire Bible and say, All of you need to believe this. Well, okay, that would be possible for the church to do, but would it really be the best thing for the church to do? One reason it might not be the best thing is because it would take a lot of time to do, because the church doesn't want to do anything sloppy. You know, it does every time the church issues a teaching, they spend a lot of time studying it first. And so they'd have to devote a lot of effort to trying to write a commentary on the entire Bible. And that would suck efforts away from everything else the church needs to do. You know, if you've got all your your theologians working on that and all your bishops reviewing it to make sure we all agree that this is what the church really says about this, then you're going to have a... It would be crippling for the church to try to write to just say, we're going to take the next century and write a commentary on the whole Bible. So that would that would be one reason it would be a bad idea. Another reason it would be a bad idea is that it would fossilize Catholic scriptural thought. Because one of the things Jesus told the disciples is the Holy Spirit's going to lead you into all truth. Right. But that happens across the course of Christian history, not at any one moment. And so if the church wrote a commentary on the entire Bible right now, then it would stop Catholic scholars from further exploring ideas and testing new ideas and arguments and trying to figure out better understandings of Scripture. So it would actually limit the ongoing development of the church's understanding of Scripture. And that leads to the third reason why um, it would be a bad idea for the church to do this, which is scripture has more than one layer of meaning. 
and there can be legitimate differences of opinion. And if the church just said, this is what you need to believe about this passage, that would stop people from exploring other layers of meaning that also can be in there. Amen. So wonderful reminder for all of us Catholics that we cannot just limit or contain the Word of God in a particular line of thinking because there are layers. I think in Unboxing and even in Jeruga podcast, we covered about the senses of scriptures. And, you know, uh, another very interesting thing that we need to unbox when it comes to symbolism is something that I used to to to, to preach from the pulpit as a, as a young Protestant minister back then that the Catholic Church or is the whore of Babylon. So what is the real deal about the whore of Babylon? It's so easy for young Protestants or young non-Catholic Christians to just buy into the argument that it's actually the church. But how can we really understand the whore of Babylon? And how can we defend this that, that the church is not that whore of Babylon that Revelation is talking about? Okay, so I actually wrote this this theory is something you hear in various circles. And I actually wrote a pair of articles, or one, depending on the format you see it in, also it can be one long article, um, on the, the Horror Babylon interpretation. And you can find that at jimmyakin.com. The essays is a two-part essay or also at catholic.com. But if you Google Jimmy Aiken and Horror Babylon, you'll find this. And like one of the pieces is called Hunting the Horror Babylon. Um, but I, I go through the description of the Whore of Babylon, and then I talk about how well does it fit the church or something else. And so the Whore of Babylon is a figure that John sees in chapter, it's between chapters 17 and, and um, 19 of the book of Revelation. Um, he's just witnessed this climactic, you know, kind of crescendo of events happen and then one of one of the angels in heaven or one of the elders in heaven takes him and says i'm going to show you the horror of babylon and he takes him out to the wilderness and he sees this woman and she's finely clothed she's she's got scarlet and purple on and she's sitting on the back of the seven-headed beast and she's drunk on the blood of the saints so that tells right. us she's persecuting and murdering saints um also she's seated on this uh, beast with seven heads. Now that is led. Uh, we're also told one other thing that's important here, which is she's a city. She's not a church. She's a city, and right. she's put in contrast to the bride of Christ, who John sees a few chapters later. And the same thing happens. Uh, one of the elders comes to John and says, "I'm going to show you." Or angels comes to John and says, "I'm going to show you the bride of Christ." And he takes him and he sees the bride of Christ, the city New Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. So we have these two cities, the whore and the bride, you know, the prostitute and the legitimate wife um, put in parallel to each other, and they're meant to mirror each other, and they're both cities. The, uh, the, the bride of Christ is the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, and that tells us that the whore of Babylon is going to be an earthly city. Right. The question is, which one? Well... There are a couple of ways you could look at it. One way would be to say, okay, the whore is seated on top of this beast with seven heads. Rome is famous for having seven hills, so this, right. this, this whore must be pagan Rome, the Rome of the first century with the emperors who are persecuting Christians and putting them to death. And so it can fit Rome, but... There's a question about, is it Rome? Because elsewhere in the book of Revelation, we hear about the great city, just like we hear about Babylon as a great city. We hear about the great city where the Lord was crucified. Well, Jesus wasn't crucified in Rome. He was crucified in Jerusalem. So could the whore of Babylon be Jerusalem? Well, one of the things you find when you read it is, you know, the in addition to having the seven heads, the the beast also has these ten horns that represent local rulers, and we're told that the that they hate the whore, and they're going to gang up on the whore and defeat her. Well, okay, if this city is Jerusalem, she was hated 
by various pagan rulers who were local in nature, and they ganged up on her, and they de they demolished her. They tore Jerusalem down to the ground, including the temple. So it's possible you could read the whore either as Rome persecuting Christians or as Jerusalem persecuting Christians. And actually, the data fits both of them pretty well. I've even seen a suggestion by one scholar that says, okay, it's kind of both. It's any great, any great earthly city that sets itself in opposition to God is a fulfillment of the whore. And that's possible. So I think there are different views on uh, who the whore could be. It could be Rome, could be Jerusalem, could be Rome and Jerusalem, could be any earthly city that puts itself up against God, but it's an earthly city. And it existed in the first century because that's the part of the book of Revelation we're dealing with, or at least the early centuries before we get to the millennium. So it existed in the early church, and it persecuted Christ, not just Christians, but also apostles, and they only existed in the early church. So this figure, whatever it is, has to exist in the early church, and it's a city that persecutes Christians, most likely Rome or Jerusalem. But it's pre-Christian Rome. It's not the Christian church as based in Rome. It persecutes Christians. It's not the persecutor of Christians. It, it does uh, make sense. I said uh, that backwards, yeah. but you see what I mean. <laughs> yes, yes. It, it does make sense, uh, especially if the the book of Revelation is meant to to give hope to Christians, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the time of persecution, then it must be in a time when persecution is rampant. The, there's one symbol that you mentioned a bit already earlier, Jimmy, the beast of Revelation and mm -hmm. 666, the symbol. You, you alluded this to Nero already, mm -hmm. uh, but some anti-Catholics say that 666 is attributed to the Pope. And yeah, why, why is this not this the Pope? Is not this is nonsense. Um, for one thing, this is a political leader that demands to be worshipped as a god and that exists in the first century and that persecuted Christians in the first century. This is all about Rome. It's clear, whatever the whore is, the beast that the horse sits on, and this could be, this may not, by the way, be a geographical relationship. It may be a political alliance between Jerusalem and Rome to persecute Christians. That's what the beast seated on, the horse seated on the beast may symbolize. The, the you know, Jerusalem is being supported by Roman authority, and they're both attacking Christians. Um, but uh the, the there's just not a description of the pope here um the pope is not a worldwide political leader who persecutes christians in the first century or the first few centuries and and so forth the linking of the number 666 to the pope is kind of sleight of hand you can you can make anybody have the number 666 if you get to pick the system that you're using. I even did this I, back when I was uh, in like middle school or junior high, as we called it in my town, back in the 1970s, there were, there was this set of movies that came out called date called the omen, which were about the antichrist. And, and so the, who, who has the number six, six, six was a kind of a question at the time. And I discovered you can make anybody's name add up to six, six, six. If you get to right. pick the rules, I would even do that to friends of mine. I wasn't a Christian at the time, really, but I would say, oh, did you know your name adds up to 666? Here's how it does it. And um, it was just kind of a spooky game. I wouldn't play it today, but I did then. Um, well, okay, so how does that happen with the Pope? Well, now, in various ancient languages, uh, they didn't have a separate number system the way we do today. Um, you know, it, we use what are often in English called Arabic numerals, you know, one, two, three, four, the symbols for those, right. but there really would be better called Indian numerals because they came from India um, by way of Arabic culture. So that's why they're called Arabic numerals. Um, but we all, so, but we have a set of numbers and a set of letters, your ABCs and your one, two, threes. Well, they didn't have that distinction in, in the ancient world. So they had alphabets, 
but they didn't have a separate number system. So what they would do is they would use letters of the alphabet for numbers. So in Greek, for example, alpha was one, beta was two, gamma was three. And then once you get up to iota, which is 10, um, they start counting by tens. So lambda is 10, kappa is 20, uh, sorry, lambda is 20, kappa is 30, and so on. And then when you run out of the... Um, out of the tens, when you get up to 100, you start counting by hundreds. And they did basically the same thing with the Hebrew and Aramaic alphabets, which are the same alphabet. Um, but the letters are a little bit different in Aramaic than they are in Greek. You know, the alphabet's a little different. So the the Hebrew and Aramaic letters had somewhat different number values than the Greek ones did. So, so what happened is um, after the time of the Reformation, People wanted to say, they wanted to portray the Catholic Church as the whore of Babylon. They wanted to portray the Pope as the Antichrist because that's the only way as a European that you could really justify breaking away from the Catholic Church. Because in you know in the 1400s, everybody in Western Europe knows this is a true church. So how do you break away from it if it's the Church of Christ? And what they did was they searched around, oh, Revelation has this evil thing that's opposite the Jer New Jerusalem. It has this whore Babylon, so that must be what the Catholic Church is. And then you can explain why the Catholic Church is so big and impressive, but not be the Church of Christ. Oh, and there's this leader of it, this Antichrist figure, so that must be the Pope. And then they would look around to see, is there anything about the Pope that we could add up to 666? And they ended up coming up with a phrase. The phrase in Latin is vicarius filii dei. And if you take, it means vicar of the Son of God. And if you take vicarius filii dei and you forget all the letters that don't have meaning in Latin, and you individually add up the I's, which means one, the V's, which means five, the X's, there's not really an X in it, but that would mean 10, the L that means 50, the C that means 100, you add all of that up in Vicarious Filii Day and ignore the rest, you get 666, assuming you add it up a certain way. Actually, you have to be careful because in Latin, if you put a, a, a one in front of a five, it doesn't add, it becomes a four. If you put it the other way around, if you put the, the, the five first and the one second, it becomes a six. So um, if you actually look at the spelling of Vicarius Filii Dei, if you take account of the comes before or comes after rule, it actually doesn't add up to 666. It's only if you ignore that rule. But then you've got another problem, which is why would you be using Latin anyway? Because Revelation isn't written in Latin. It's written in Greek, by someone who was a native speaker of either Hebrew or Aramaic. So Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek are the languages we should be looking at for this, not Latin. And it so happens that if you add up one spelling of Nero Caesar, which actually would be Neron Caesar, it adds up to 666. But there's a second way to spell Nero in Hebrew and Aramaic, which is just Nero Caesar. You leave off one of the news. Uh, noon is the name of the Hebrew and Aramaic letter. Noon is, has a value of 50. So if you take 666 and you drop one of the noons off of Nero, so it just becomes Nero, you get an overall value of Nero Caesar as 616. And guess what? There are early manuscripts of Revelation that give the number as 616. So it looks like people in the, in the first and second century, when Revelation was first being copied, knew about the connection between the beast and Nero Caesar. And depending on how they, they spelled Nero Caesar with or without the noon, they either wrote 666 or 616 in their copies of Revelation, and this gives us very early Christian evidence that uh, the number was understood in the early days to refer to Nero Caesar, not the Pope, who didn't even have the title Vicarius Filii Dei. Wonderful. I mean, these are 
Yeah, very important uh, talking points that all Catholics should know, right, Jay? And I, I remember, Jimmy, when I was a non-Catholic uh, uh, Protestant before, non-Catholic Christian, we used to have a very literal view of the 1,000 years in the Scripture, mm -hmm. and we would always connect it to the concept of rapture. Could you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about this 1,000-year thing, and is the rapture even biblical? Well, there is an event that you can call the rapture. It's not mentioned in Revelation. There's, there's, and that's one of the striking things about Revelation is you can read it from front to back. There's no rapture in it. There's no point where, um, where Jesus descends into the atmosphere and catches away all of his followers and then goes back to heaven for a period and then comes back later. That never happens in Revelation. Um, but that's the classic understanding of what the rapture is supposed to be. Well, there is a, an event that's similar to that, but it's not described in Revelation. It's described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, in this passage, St. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians because some of them, you know, they're brand new converts. Paul only got to stay with them a brief time before a riot drove him out of Thessalonica. You can read about that in the book of Acts. Um, and he, so they haven't had a lot of training in the faith, but they've, they've been told they need to be faithful to Jesus until he returns to get into heaven. And that raises a question. My aunt, who is a fellow Christian, just died one of the Thessalonians says. So she didn't get to be faithful to Christ until he came back. Does that mean she's not going to be in heaven? What's going to happen to the Christians who have died before Jesus gets back? Are they deprived of the kingdom? And so Paul writes them and says, no, dudes, chill. The, you're, the dead in Christ are going to be okay. Here's how it's going to work. Jesus is going to come back, and then the dead shall rise first, and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the twinkling of an eye and will always be with Jesus together. So we're, it's going to be great. We're all going to be there. Your aunt's going to be there. Your, your, everyone else in Thessalonica who's died, they're all going to get to be there too. You don't have to be alive at the moment of the second coming to get to go to heaven. So that's his basic message to them. Well, um, believers in the rapture who are a recent phenomenon, um, this really only goes back to the early 1800s. So for the first, you know, 1800 years of church history, nobody had heard of the rapture. Nobody right. ever read this verse. You know, the Christian community did not read this verse this way. This is a very recent thing. It is not the majority position, even in Protestantism. But um, it, historic Protestants don't buy this, and you know it's really in American evangelicalism and places that American evangelicalism have influenced that have this idea that Jesus is going to come back, all the Christians are going to get caught up to be with him, and then he's going to go back to heaven for a period of several years while the Antichrist reigns on earth, and then he's going to come back. Well, Okay, that's a very new theory. It's even a minority theory in Protestantism, but there are some problems with it from uh, when you actually read what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians. Part of the problem is we, we today are not familiar with what would happen when a visiting dignitary came. Right. In, 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 because what's happening is, you know, Paul doesn't really say, well, okay, we all get caught up to be with Jesus. What happens next? He doesn't say he goes back to heaven. He also doesn't say he comes down to earth. It could be either one. So which is it? Well, people who, who support the so called rapture say, oh, he's going to go back to heaven and everyone's going to chill out there for until the Antichrist is done and then we all come back. But, um, and I'm, I'm going to be concise about this because I, I, I don't want to dump too much data on the audience, but um, that's not what happened when a dignitary visited your city. What Paul's talking about is the coming of the Lord. So this is when the Lord comes. Well, what happened when a, when a, when a dignitary like a king came to your city? You didn't go out to meet him and then run away from the city. Instead, you had people from the city go meet him and escort him back 
to the city. And so that's the image that Paul is drawing on here. He is saying when Jesus comes back, we're going to meet him in the air, and then we're going to come with him back to earth for the final judgment. And so that's the image he's talking about based on the ancient custom of greeting dignitaries like kings. There's also other problems with this. If you study it in, if this is the coming of Jesus, you know, Paul's talking about it like there's one, um, then why doesn't Paul mention the other coming after the Antichrist? You know, he's silent about that. If Jesus is going to come back three or seven years after this one, why does he talk about this as just the coming of the Lord instead of the next coming of the Lord, as if there's going to be one after that? And if you compare the material in 2 Corinthians, because after the Corinthians got, I'm sorry, Thessalonians, after the Thessalonians got 1 Thessalonians, it, it, they were still confused. And so a few months later, Paul, or weeks later, Paul writes him another letter and says, let me clarify. And he goes back over this information about how the world's going to end. And it's clear he's talking about the end of the world. He's not talking about something more than a thousand years before the end of the world. He's talking about the real end. And so there is an event that you can call a rapture where Christians are going to get caught up to be with Jesus forever, but it's not a thousand and something years before the end of the world. It's right at the end of the world. Amen. Well, Jim, Jimmy, there, there's so much to unpack, and listeners of this podcast will surely re-listen to this episode over and over again and take notes. Jimmy, we've come to the end of the episode. Uh, there, one episode of the podcast is not enough to to talk about revelation True. and 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 it's ironic that we're talking about revelation and we're having so much fun talking about revelation and i'll just ask one yeah, i'll just ask one question one last question mm -hmm. and with with everything that happened covid and all that stuff uh, some say that the world is heating and other can have different opinions on that I guess I just want to ask, are we in the end times, Jimmy? Well, from one perspective, we are, and that's been true since the first century. We're in mm. the final stage of God's plan before there's a big renovation of the world. Um, and, you know, John talks about how we're in the end times now. But uh, just because we're in the final stage of history doesn't mean that the time is short as of right now from a human perspective. I would say that it's obviously shorter than it was 2,000 years ago, but mm -hmm. I don't have mm -hmm. proof that Jesus is going to come back you know, tomorrow or next year or 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now. Mm -hmm. We've already seen that the end times can go on for 2,000 years. They could go on for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I had to guess, I would say, you know, it's kind of significant when Israel gets its land back. Mm -hmm. And that happened in 1948. And, you know, we do have a culture that's falling apart. That's not yes. proof because the culture is always seeming to fall apart to people. But you can certainly make a case right now that we've got a, a in many parts of the world, like Europe and the United States, we have a much less Christian culture than we used to. So that could be a sign. But then we lost half of Christendom when the Muslim movement emerged and they conquered North Africa and the Middle East. And, you know, Christianity took a big blow then. So you can't just mm -hmm. look at mm -hmm. a big blow and say, this must be the end. Well, maybe, we're, um, certainly we're getting closer. Some of these might be indications that we're fairly close, but they might not. Um, the one that's kind of the most significant to me is Israel getting its land back. Mm. Um, you know, that may or may not, the modern state of Israel may or may not be a, a fulfillment of prophecy. You can read it both ways, mm. but it's certainly a significant development that could indicate we are closer rather than farther away from the end. But it still could go on for centuries before we get to the final end. So I advise people not stress about it and leave it in God's hands. 
Jimmy Burns, we may or may not be in the end times yet, but we are certainly at the end of this episode. Uh, Jimmy, we enjoyed our time with you, and I hope we can invite you again in future episodes sure. to talk yeah. about the the weird stuff that you talk no, about. In yep. happy to do that, and in fact, I'll mention if you're interested more in Revelation, I've done some mysterious worlds about the Book of Revelation. Mm. There's and uh, related concepts. There's an episode of Mysterious World on the Antichrist. There's another on the Mark of the Beast. So just Google mm. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World Antichrist and Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World Mark of the Beast, and you'll come up with those. Real, real quick, I just want to ask this about Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, uh, which is popular here in the Philippines. I know, awesome. I, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you check the analytics, but it enters the podcast charts here in the country. So mm-hmm. I, I, I just like to ask, is it easy or hard to talk about these subjects in Jimmy's Mysterious World, especially in the supernatural stuff, lining them to our Catholic faith? No, I don't find it hard. I find it stimulating mm. um, to, to, I do research every week. I bang out about a 30 to 60 page script and uh, I find it stimulating. Um, so I'm always learning, I'm always processing things. And one of the ways I process things is by figuring out how would I say this to someone else? And I make lists mm-hmm. and I organize and so forth. So I actually find it energizing. Wow. Burns, before we let Jimmy go, any message you'd like to tell Jimmy? I just want to thank you, Jimmy, for all the work that you've done for the church. And I always think that we are living in exciting times. What a great time for us to be Catholics. And thank you for inspiring us in our apologetics ministry here in the Philippines. Unboxing Catholicism will not be where it is today. Even the J. Aruga podcast will not be where it is today if not because of you guys at uh, at Catholic Answers saying yes to the mission that God has given you for evangelization. So we are so honored to be working with you from this side of the world. And we can't wait to collaborate further with you, Catholic Answers, and our apologist friends there in the United States. And we are praying for you and we request that re- remember that you have a lot of friends back here in the Philippines, and we hope you could visit us in the near future. Thank you so much. Y'all are most kind, and uh, we really appreciate your prayers. Um, and I personally appreciate your prayers. And we pray for our overseas brethren in Christ. Uh, I always try to honor other people by you know using a um, a little bit of their own language as a way of honoring their own culture. That's why I said uh, kabusta, kabusta at the beginning yeah. of the show. And so at this point, uh, let me say uh, salamat at palam. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Jimmy. Anything else you'd like to promote, Jimmy, before we end the episode? No, like I said, uh, you can find out more about Catholic Answers. That's where I work at uh, catholic.com. You can take online courses in apologetics at schoolofapologetics.com. My personal website is jimmyakin.com. My YouTube channel, which I hope you will like and subscribe to and hit the notification so you get notified when I put up videos. (laughs) Um, That's youtube.com slash jimmyakin. And you can also go to the Mysterious World homepage, mysterious.fm, or just look up Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World in any podcast app or directory. Yes. uh, Burns, anything you'd like to promote on your side? Yes. Thank you so much, Jay, for having me as your co-host. It's an honor again to meet Jimmy Aiken, and I'm so excited for the fruits of this episode. And for you guys who are interested to defend the faith clearly without being preachy, I wrote a short ebook that will share with you how to get started with it. So you can download it at unboxingcatholicism.com slash starter guide. And as the content lead of Hollow in the Philippines, I also want to offer everyone three months free subscription on Hollow. Just go to hollow.com slash unboxing Catholicism to redeem it. Hollow is the number one Catholic prayer and meditation app in the world today. That's available in several languages, including Filipino, where you could pray with Father Franz Dizon, Bishop Robert Barron, Father Mike Schmitz, and other known Catholics. Jimmy is also there, I think, for the Catholic FAQs. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy Burns. Everyone, this has been another episode of the Jay Aruga Show slash Unboxing Catholicism. At the end of the day, it will be night. Goodbye.